Hello and welcome to the My Ministry Mission Podcast, where I'm taking you on a journey with me from unbeliever to disciple of Christ. As a Christian learning in the faith, I try to tackle challenging and difficult topics, and I want to share with you what I've discovered as I seek a position of ministry in my life. I'd love to hear from you, so join me online at myministrymission.com or find my social media links in the show notes. My name is Jason, and this is my mission. Hello and welcome back to the My Ministry Mission podcast. If this is your first time listening to this podcast, you're actually in the middle of a series I'm doing on the Farewell Discourse. So I actually suggest you go back and listen to episodes 31 and 32 so you can get caught up. Now, if you are caught up, then you know in my last episode, I talked about love being the central theme of the Farewell Discourse. I went over the promise of the Father's house, and then I spent a little time on how Jesus is the only way to the Father. Now, in today's episode, we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit within the context of the Farewell Discourse. Now, this topic really covers two separate sections of the Farewell Discourse, the first being on the topic of love and obedience, which spans John 14, chapters 15 through 31. And then I'll dive into the role of the Holy Spirit, which is covered in John 15, verses 26 through John 16, verse 15. With that said, sit back and relax and enjoy today's episode of the My Ministry Mission Podcast. Before I get started, I'm going to take some advice from my buddy Keith over at the Behind Closed Doors Ministry Podcast, and I'm going to kick a door open for you guys. But before I do that, I do recommend you visit his podcast at BehindCloseDoorsMinistry.Buzzsprout.com. Now, I left a link in the show notes to go there, so give it a listen if you get a chance. That being said, I probably don't spend enough time letting you guys know me better. So to that end, I'm going to let you know that my day job involves working in technology. Now, in the past, I've done a lot of IT work from network administration to system administration, even a little development, and I'm definitely not a fan of coding. But more recently, I've been working as a technical project manager. With that being said, I have done this kind of work for a very long time. And as I mentioned in episode 31, I I used to think that this work would bring me glory, or at least I used to do the work to bring myself glory. And I've been struggling with this as a Christian. When I got baptized, I emerged from the water a new person, as we all do. But this new person I've become has a very strong calling towards ministry. Now, thanks to some devotionals I've been going through recently, I've discovered that there are two flaws to my struggle. Now, the first is that my work never really brought me glory, but I can do my work in a way that will bring glory to God. And Paul reminded me of this when I read 1 Corinthians 10, 32. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I admit, many days I get so involved with my work that I I forget to ask God to join me as I face challenges of my job. I have the opportunity to glorify God and Jesus Christ every single day. We all do. And I I need to do better there. So I've made a commitment to spend time in prayer throughout the day as I face challenges and frustrations and to ask the Holy Spirit to guide me through and, and be a good servant of Christ. Again, I go to Paul's words in Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Now, the second flaw is that being in ministry vocationally is not the only way to minister. I believe God is challenging me to learn how to embody His Word in my efforts today. God designed us to do work, and the work we do should be seen as a blessing. King Solomon reminds us of this in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also, I saw, was from the hand of God. Work is a part of God's plan. It always has been. We're called to do His good works in our works. No matter how mundane or insignificant we feel that our jobs are, If we go to work and do our best in the name of God the Father and of Jesus Christ, well, I mean, that speaks volumes about our character. Instead of getting frustrated and complaining about those pesky co-workers who cause us problems, we should look at this as an opportunity to exercise our godly behavior through forgiveness and understanding. These opportunities are for us to uphold Christ's commandment to love each other. So I'm making a commitment to God to invite Him into my workplace and to accept the blessings of work whatever that may be. I plan on reporting back to you at some point to let you know how this is going. I do feel like this is a test of my commitment towards ministry. 
But how about you? Are you sick of your job, sick of your coworkers, sick of your boss? Maybe you and I can both make some sort of a commitment like this. I'm hopeful that, that as I become more intentional about bringing God into my workplace with me, that he will change my heart and I will experience a new level of joy as I toil away. But understand, I'm not suggesting that we start reading the Gospels to our coworkers or posting Bible verses around the work area. I'm suggesting that we reflect on the Gospels and our behavior and let our attitudes be improved through the Holy Spirit. So what do you say? You up for the challenge? All right, so we begin talking about love and obedience in the context of the Holy Spirit, starting in John 14, verses 15 through 17. Now, this comes off the heels of Jesus having just washed the disciples' feet, demonstrating his remarkable love and setting an example for his followers to keep. And then Jesus tells them, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. So Jesus demonstrated his love for the disciples, and now he is asking them to show their love for him by keeping his commandments. And so far, these seem to include washing each other's feet as he washed theirs, John 13, verse 14 through 15, loving each other as he loved us, which was in John 13, 34, and then putting their faith in God, the Father, and in Jesus himself, in John 14, 1. When we consider our love for Jesus, having this emotional attachment or connection seems like the easiest way to kind of objectify that love. And there's nothing wrong with this. But if we truly want to demonstrate how much we love Christ, we do so by keeping his commandments. We do so by putting our faith in the Father and loving each other. Keeping Christ's commandments not only shows our love, but it also demonstrates our own personal morality. Now, that being said, Jesus also knew that the disciples didn't have a chance of keeping his commandments without God's presence. So Jesus has promised to pray to the Father and ask for an advocate to come live within us so that we have a better chance of keeping those commandments. And of course, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. This was the second of Christ's three assurances. Now, remember, the first assurance was that the disciples will continue to do the work of Christ and do greater things. I talked about that one in the previous episode. But now Christ is promising to send them an advocate, a helper. And here we have all three aspects of the triune God. We have Jesus, who will pray to God the Father to send the Holy Spirit. Now, the word for advocate or helper or comforter, uh, depending on the version of the Bible you're reading, is the Greek word parakletos. But this word means much more. It represents someone who is summoned to the aid of another, like an intercessor. And then Jesus tells us that the world cannot understand the Spirit or receive the Spirit, so he spoke of basically three aspects of the disciples' relationship with the Holy Spirit in contrast to the world. Now, first, they should know the Holy Spirit, and then they should have the Holy Spirit with them, and then eventually they will have the Holy Spirit in them. So let me ask you, do you know the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit with you? Does the Holy Spirit live within you? Of course, you and I should say yes to this, but for those remaining 11 disciples, the Spirit was already with them, but would be in them later. So now Jesus goes on in John 14, verse 18, to make his third assurance. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I'm sure there were doubts in the disciples' minds and in their hearts. Once Jesus leaves, does that mean game over? Have they reached the end of their discipleship program? Of course not. They were just at the beginning. The disciples are worried that they will become orphans. So Spurgeon identified several ways that the disciples were not like orphans. So, for example, orphans have dead parents. The Spirit shows us that Jesus is alive. Orphans are left alone. The Spirit draws us closer to God, uh, to God's presence, and is always with us. Well, orphans lose their provider, but the Spirit provides for all things. Orphans are left without any instruction or guidance, but the Spirit teaches us all things. And then finally, orphans have nobody to defend them, but the Spirit is our protector. So we continue on in John fourteen nineteen, which starts with Jesus telling the disciples, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. So it's, I mean, it's true that they did see Jesus again after he rose from the dead. But more importantly, it's true when he ascends to heaven as well. Seeing him physically, I mean, that's neat, especially considered he's dead and was resurrected. But seeing him and knowing Christ in spirit, I mean, man, there's something very powerful in that. An apostle Paul later wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 5.16. He said, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. But then Jesus goes on in that same verse, verse 19. Because I live, 
you also will live. So now the dependency on Jesus will not end when he departs. It will continue on in a more amazing way through the Holy Spirit. They wouldn't just see Jesus by the Spirit. They would continue to live in Jesus through the works of the Holy Spirit. Spurgeon wrote, A man is saved because Christ died for him. He continues saved because Christ lives for him. The sole reason why the spiritual life abides is because Jesus lives. I mean, man, that's something wonderful, isn't it? I mean, guys, I don't know if you're making this clear or not. It, it, I've said this before. It completely blows my mind to think about what Jesus did. Dying for us and granting us salvation through his blood. I, this is just the beginning. Accepting Jesus will save you, absolutely. But you and I continue on filled with the living God because of the Spirit. We continue to receive gifts through Christ every single day. But let's continue on with John 14, verse 20. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Understand, this is a lifelong relationship we're blessed with. A union between God the Father, God the Son, and us, all through the Holy Spirit. Again, we see the Trinity in perfect harmony here. And then we have John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Look, Jesus is telling the disciples that if they truly love him, not some superficial idle sentiment, but really love him, then Christ will manifest himself to them and in their works. Now listen to this part. Whoever has my commandments. Isn't that a, isn't that a funny way of saying that? Not whoever obeys my commandments. No, he specifically says whoever has them and keeps them. Look, if you want to know Christ, I mean, really know him to the point where he manifests himself in your life, then you need to have those commandments. Meaning you need to take Christ's commandments and make them a part of your being. Make them a part of your inner self, and you keep them there. So in John 14, 22, Judas, not Judas Iscariot the betrayer, but a different one known as Judas of James, he asked a really great question of Jesus. He asked, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? So basically, he wanted to know how Jesus' departure would reveal himself to the disciples and not the rest of the world. I mean, if Jesus is going to reveal himself, why wouldn't the entire world see it? In response to this, Jesus replied in John 14, 23, and 24, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and that we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. To me, this seemed a bit cryptic, but basically Jesus is recounting what he had said in previous verses, and simply put, Jesus would reveal himself to the disciples through love, obedience, and the union of the Father and the Son. Now remember, Jesus told them that if they love him, they will keep his word. If they love him and are obedient to him, the presence of God and of Christ will be realized. The world at large did not know Jesus the way the disciples knew him. The world did not love Christ the way the disciples loved him. And the world did not know his word like the disciples knew his word. So the presence of God would not be revealed to the rest of the world. At least not yet. And now in John 14, verses 25 and 26, Jesus promises the coming of the Helper. He tells them, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So Jesus first mentioned the Helper in John fourteen sixteen. We discussed this as the second assurance just a few few minutes ago. But Jesus is telling him that the Advocate, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, would come to the, the disciples on the merits of Jesus Christ as a representative of him. This means the disciples don't have to request the Spirit based on their own merits. And they should expect the Spirit to resemble the nature and character of Jesus as revealed in God's Word. So once again, we're seeing this wonderful Trinity working together. The Holy Spirit would be a continuation of Christ's teachings and, and was there to remind them what they had already learned. Now remember that the Holy Spirit didn't end with the disciples, though. You and I are also filled with the same presence of God who will be our advocate, our helper, our teacher. Now this next verse, John fourteen twenty seven, is definitely up there as one of my favorites. Jesus tells them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Jesus is taking a common saying in their culture, the saying of peace be with you or shalom, as you and I might say goodbye to each other. And he infused the standard parting with such a deep and powerful meaning by adding the peace, my peace I give to you, my peace I give to you. Look, Jesus had no inheritance or wealth to leave with his disciples, but what he did leave them was so much more. 
the power of the Holy Spirit and the peace of Jesus Christ himself. This is a peace that is derived from a trusting love in God the Father. And again, Jesus reminds them not to let their hearts be troubled and not to be afraid. But Jesus goes on to tell them in John 14, verses 28 and 29, You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe me. The disciples were clearly troubled. They were sad, confused, scared. But Jesus is telling them that they should rejoice for his sake, and for their own sake, and for the sake of the world. What better place could there be than being at the presence of God the Father? Jesus has already assured them in his first assurance that they would go on to do much better things with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is a wonderful thing for the world. You and I have the benefit of the lessons of Christ because of what the disciples went on to do, fueled by the Holy Spirit. And and that couldn't have happened if not for Jesus' departure. But as we close out this chapter, chapter 14 of the book of John, things start to get a bit intense in John 14, verses 30 and 31. Jesus tells him, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Jesus knew that Satan was coming for him because at that very moment, Judas Iscariot was arranging for the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus assures them that Satan has no hold over him. No ounce of deception could get past Jesus. But Jesus went on to the cross willingly, in loving obedience to God the Father, and out of a perfect and infinite love for the world. The last comment, come now, let us leave, was was a point where Jesus and his disciples left the table and made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's unknown whether the rest of the farewell discourse was done en route to the to Gethsemane or whether they may have lingered for a bit. But one thing we do know is that time was ticking away and Jesus' death was coming soon. So now I'm going to skip ahead uh, to the end of John chapter 15, where Jesus begins to tell us of the role of the Holy Spirit. And it kind of spills over into about, about the first half of John chapter 16. But we've discussed how Jesus spoke of sending the Helper in John 14, 16, and again in John 14, 26. Jesus knew that the disciples would need the power of the Holy Spirit to face what was coming. And he began to elaborate on this in John 15, verses 26 through 27, when he tells them, When the Advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you must also testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So, I'm going to pause right here for a rabbit hole. I mean, come on, guys, you knew it was coming eventually, right? In verse 26, it states that the Advocate comes from the Father— And this opens up kind of a huge debate in the Christian community under what is referred to as the filioque clause in the Nicene Creed. Now, this topic involves the Trinity, and it it was kind of a tough concept for me to wrap my mind around. And unfortunately, I don't have time to explain it in great detail in this episode, but I kind of wanted to touch on it a little bit. Now, in Latin, filioque means end from the sun. And the controversy is basically whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father or from the Father and the Son. Now, my understanding of this is that the Council of Nicaea, held in 325 AD, affirmed the relationship between the Father and the Son. This was the first ecumenical council, meaning a representation of a number of different Christian churches. Now, a second one of these councils was held in 381 AD in the uh, city of Constantinople, which amended the Nicene Creed to further clarify the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is often referred to as the Nicene Constantinople Creed, but understand that at the end of the Second Council, the Creed indicated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, period. But then around 447 AD in Spain, during the Second Council of Toledo, the Filioque Clause started to gain recognition. And then this was added to the Creed in the Third Council of Toledo in 589 AD, which indicated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. Now, neither the Second nor the Third Council of Toledo were really considered an ecumenical council, but for the Filioque Clause, it started to gain popularity with Christians in the West, whereas Christians in the East did not recognize that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son at all, just the Father. Now, I understand that this controversy continues even to today. And if you want to do some more fun reading, I definitely recommend looking into this on your own because it really is a fascinating topic. All right, so that that ends the rabbit hole, and there were there were a lot of words in that whole thing that I struggled to pronounce. So if I said any of those words wrong, I'm sorry. Feel free to let me know. You can email me from my website. 
But also, if, if you have more information on this topic and want to share it, I'm definitely welcome. You know, I welcome it. But getting back to the topic at hand. So Jesus had told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would continue his teachings back in John 14, 26. And then here in John 15, 26, Jesus is letting his disciples know that the Spirit who's, who goes out from the Father will testify about him, meaning Jesus. And then in verse 27, Jesus is letting his disciples know that they are qualified to bear witness to Christ because they have been with him. They trust him and the Holy Spirit will testify to him. I mean, basically, they're all a part of each other's lives at this point. And then the conversation takes a bit of a change as Jesus warns his disciples about persecution in John 16, verses 1 through 4. He tells them, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. Okay, so Jesus, obviously, he doesn't want his disciples to be surprised or taken off guard when their persecution starts. The, the religious leaders would include prayers of a curse on the Nazarenes at the synagogues to ensure that the followers of Christ could take no part in service. And then time came when people such as Saul of Tarsus, you know, before his conversion, would persecute and kill the followers of Jesus, thinking they were doing the work of God. More than anything, Jesus wanted to protect his disciples. And while he was with them, the wrath of the world was drawn to him, drawn to Jesus. But once he departed, once he was hung on the cross and, and killed, their focus would inevitably fall upon his followers, and he would not be there to draw their attention away from them any longer. But after giving them the downside of this, Jesus flips the conversation to talk about the benefits of his departure in John 16, verses 5 through 7. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is, your, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So ironically, Peter has already asked Jesus where he was going in John thirteen thirty six, And then Thomas asked him the same question in John fourteen five. Do you think the disciples wondered about Jesus's destination? Or were they more concerned about parting from Jesus? I mean, I think the latter, which is why I think he recognized their grief, but he followed that up with helping them to understand that there is a benefit to him leaving. I'm, I'm sure it was really difficult for the disciples to believe any good would come from the master leaving them. We often consider how our loved ones who are near death are going to a better place. We consider their benefit, even though we are grieving, but I, I don't think we ever consider our benefit. I mean, that seems very taboo, but this is exactly what Jesus wanted them to do. Do you think they considered the advantage of Jesus being arrested? That his ministry and his miracles would end? Do they consider that there was an advantage to him being beaten, mocked, sentenced for execution, nailed to a cross, and dying? Do you think they considered that there was an advantage to his lifeless body laying in a tomb? But Jesus called on them to look towards the benefit of the world. Until Jesus left, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, would not come to us. We can look back with hindsight and see how this all worked towards growing the ministry to the entire world. But in that moment, how could they possibly comprehend what was going on? And then we see in John 16 verses 8 through 11, some very powerful words are dropped by Jesus. He tells them, and when he, meaning the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world of concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. There are three truths that are being laid on the disciples. The first is sin as a truth about man. The second is righteousness as the truth about God. And the third truth is judgment, which is the inevitable combination of these two other truths. Now, the word convict comes from the Greek word elecho, which represents the idea of exposing, refuting, and to convince of something. Now, in our modern understanding of this word, conviction is de declaring somebody guilty of some criminal offense. And that's kind of true, but the Holy Spirit isn't here just to convict us in that sense. He wants to expose the sin of man and convince us of God's righteousness. However, for the unbeliever, it ultimately does prove one's guilt. So the Spirit is here to try to help us and the world understand the importance of trusting and believing in Christ. Ultimately, Jesus will ascend to the Father, thus proving his righteousness, and that he has perfectly fulfilled the Father's will. 
and to expose the lack of righteousness in the world who rejected him. But finally, the judgment of Satan himself. Now, this part, this part gave me chills. This means that there will be a final reckoning between God and Satan. And the Holy Spirit is reminding us that this judgment is yet to come. All right, finally, as I start to wrap up this episode, Jesus has to admit this, that his own teachings are incomplete and that the Holy Spirit will continue that teaching in John 16, verses 12 through 15. Jesus tells him, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This all leads us to the formation of the New Testament, which comes from Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Now, the New Testament is divinely inspired by God, completed by the disciples and others like Paul the Apostle. Today, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth through the Scripture as our authoritative works. It teaches us what we need to know and warns us of what is coming. And all things come to be known through the Holy Spirit, who speaks through the glorification of Christ and the authority of the Father. That's all for this episode and our discussion on the role of the Holy Spirit and touching on love and obedience in relationship to the Holy Spirit. This was such an emotional and passionate part of Jesus' discourse, and I, and I know there was a lot to unpack, but I hope you received some good information and maybe a little more understanding about the far farewell discourse and how the Holy Spirit ties into it. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, and He is a, a helper who teaches us and reminds us of what we've already learned. He provides wise counsel to, to Christ followers. He was a gift given to us by God the Father through the merits of Jesus Christ. He is a source of revelation, wisdom, and power for Christ followers. He is our strength when we fall short and intercedes for us in our weaknesses. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, meaning we, He will prove the sin, righteousness, and judgment of this world. But for you and me, He sanctifies us and enables good fruit in our lives and guides us to the eternal life through Jesus Christ. Sometimes the path we want to choose and the path we ought to choose aren't really the same. But let the Holy Spirit do His good works in your life and guide you to the blessings that God wants to grant you, even if it doesn't seem like that's what you want right now. So come back in two weeks and join me again. I'll post another episode of the Farewell Discourse covering the true vine, love and joy perfected, and the world's hatred, which covers John 15 verses 1 through 25. If you have any questions from today's episode, feel free to email me at info at myministrymission.com, or you can go to myministrymission.com and click the contact me link at the top of the page. Remember to like and subscribe to my podcast in your favorite app. Leave a rating or a comment for me. I love reading those. Join me on social media. All the links can be found on my website or right here on this episode's show notes. But until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Go in peace, my friends. Thank you again for listening to this episode. If you have any questions or comments, I urge you to visit my website at myministrymission.com. You can click the contact button, or you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash myministrymission. Remember to pray and remember to love God and each other. My name is Jason, and this is my mission.